Hello, my name is Eileen Egan. I am the Chief Nurse Practitioner and Certified Diabetes Educator at the Winthrop Center for Comprehensive Diabetes Care in Mineola, New York, and Adjunct Faculty in the Department of Graduate Studies and Advanced Practice Nursing at Stony Brook University in Stony Brook, New York. Welcome to this interactive exchange program. Our goal today is to discuss the role of incretin-based therapies in the management of type 2 diabetes. Incretin hormones are gastrointestinal peptides that stimulate insulin production and secretion from the pancreatic beta cells in response to food intake. They also regulate the pancreatic alpha cell by suppressing glucagon secretion after a meal. Their existence was first hypothesized based on the incretin effect, a physiologic phenomenon in which higher levels of insulin are secreted when glucose is given orally compared with glucose administered intravenously even when the final plasma glucose concentrations are equivalent. Scientific and clinical research has shown that these peptides regulate a wide range of physiologic processes, including lipid metabolism, gut motility, appetite, neuronal survival, and various immune processes. Let's first take a look at how the incretin system helps control postprandial blood glucose levels. After we consume food, Increased luminal levels of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins rapidly induce the release of various peptide hormones and signaling factors into the bloodstream from the enteroendocrine cells in the gut. Two of these hormones, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, or GIP, and glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, have been shown to stimulate insulin release from the pancreas. GIP is released from K cells, which are predominantly located in the proximal small intestine, whereas GLP-1 is produced by L cells, which are primarily found in the distal small intestine and colon. GIP and GLP-1 travel through the bloodstream to the pancreas. In the presence of glucose, these hormones bind to G protein coupled receptors on beta cells, resulting in enhanced insulin biosynthesis and secretion. In healthy individuals, Incretin hormones appear to be responsible for between 50 and 70 percent of the insulin release after a meal, although this point is still a matter of some debate. Higher insulin levels promote glucose uptake by the liver, skeletal muscle, and fat tissue, thereby lowering the concentration of circulating glucose. GLP-1 also inhibits the release of glucagon from pancreatic alpha cells. Lower plasma glucagon levels reduce hepatic glucose synthesis via glycogenolysis, further normalizing postprandial spikes in blood glucose levels. Because this effect is glucose dependent, reductions in blood glucose after the ingested nutrients are cleared will restore glucagon secretion and hepatic glucose production, thereby reducing the risk for hypoglycemia. The incretin system also regulates gastric emptying, intestinal motility, and satiety. For example, studies have shown that high plasma concentrations of GLP-1 inhibit the contraction of intestinal circular muscle, which is essential to churning and moving nutrients through the small intestine. GLP-1 also binds to GLP-1 receptors on vagal primary afferent fibers in the gut. The activated neurons that transmit signals from the gut to the brain, which relays the information back to various gastric muscles, reducing the speed at which nutrients pass out of the stomach and into the small intestine. This process helps spread out the intestinal absorption of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins over time, further blunting the size of postprandial spikes in blood glucose levels. GLP-1-induced activity in the vagal afferents also contributes to the centrally mediated feeling of fullness and reduced appetite following a meal. This feeling of satiety can also be augmented by the activation of GLP-1 receptors in the brain, either by low levels of centrally produced hormone or by a small amount of GLP-1 produced in the gut that avoid the usual rapid degradation by the enzyme dipeptylpeptidase 4 or DPP-4. In the clinic setting, to circumvent the activity of DPP-4 when treating patients with type 2 diabetes, we use GLP-1 analogs which have been designed to resist enzymatic cleavage. Therefore, when superphysiologic doses are given therapeutically, these analogs likely stimulate both central and peripheral GLP-1 signaling pathways involved in satiety. 
This is supported by clinical trials data showing that using GLP-1 receptor agonists to treat patients with type 2 diabetes often results in significant weight loss. To summarize, understanding five glucoregulatory effects of GLP-1 helps us to assess the value of GLP-1 in controlling glucose levels, particularly during the postprandial period. First, when food is ingested, GLP-1 is secreted by intestinal endocrine cells. GLP-1 then enhances glucose-dependent insulin secretion from beta cells in the pancreas. By decreasing the rate of gastric emptying, GLP-1 also slows uptake of nutrients into the bloodstream, allowing the body more time to control postprandial increases in glucose levels. Additionally, GLP-1 suppresses inappropriately elevated glucagon secretion from the alpha cells. Lower levels of glucagon lead to a reduction of glucose output from the liver and indirectly reduce the workload of the beta cell. Finally, GLP-1 promotes satiety, potentially through centrally mediated mechanisms, thereby reducing appetite. Of note, GLP-1 secretion is deficient in some patients with type 2 diabetes. However, the response to GLP-1 remains intact when the GLP-1 receptor is stimulated. Thus, there is therapeutic value in agonists of GLP-1 receptors, as well as molecules that inhibit the activity of DPP-4, the enzyme that normally breaks down endogenous GLP-1. Now that we've briefly reviewed incretin signaling, let's return to a case-based discussion on the potential roles of incretin-based therapies in the management of type 2 diabetes. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your program.